let me warn you at the very beginning that I'm not really going to be talking about literature. Um, I know this appoints everybody, but bear with me. Okay, um, this is called Assimilation Toward a Theory of Jewish American Literary History. For some time now, I've been thinking about the way we think about the history of Jewish American literature. I've wondered about how scholars decide what's in and what's out, where it begins, where it ends, its antecedents and its prospects, how to narrate its inner workings. It became obvious early on, and I don't think this will surprise anyone, that much of the thinking that has gone into these questions revolve around questions of Jewishness. That is to say, scholars pretty consistently judge Jewish American literature by whether and how the texts imagine uh, how the text imagines its own ethnicity. This seems to me at first a re this seemed to me at first a reasonable approach. After all, why do we study Jewish American literature to begin with, if not to relate to, even identify with the Jewishness of the texts? And yet, the more I thought about it, the less comfortable I became. Something was missing. It gradually dawned upon me that the missing element, the great absent presence in Jewish American literary study, was assimilation. That if I wanted to understand how the texts imagined Jewishness, I had also, and perhaps first, to understand how they, scholars and writers alike, <coughs> imagined assimilation. Let me be clear. When I use the word assimilation, I do not mean the simple absence or dissolution of Jewishness though it is hard to avoid that sense of the term altogether. I have no intention of taking sides in the assimilationist, transformationist debates of the 1990s, a half full, half empty tug of war that decided little. I mean rather that it, like its companion concept, Jewishness, the complex, elusive, and downright ornery phenomenon we call assimilation has itself been the object of much imaginative investment. Uh, that it has its own rich and complex intellectual history, and that it is, in fact, the engine or matrix of Jewish American literary creativity. That without assimilation, there neither would nor could be Jewish American literary history. What this means, I've tried to elaborate elsewhere. Now, a confession. While following through on this insight, I discovered that I had discovered America, or Jewish America, as it were. I realized, in other words, that my idea was not a new idea at all. Not only had it been articulated by recent historians and theorists of Jewish history, I'm thinking here particularly of Amos Fulkenstein, Jonathan Sarna, two very different ways of approaching, but also in different ways of Zygmunt Bauman and others, all of whom have contributed to my developing thought on the subject. But that it had also, in fact, informed in interesting ways the thinking of some important Jewish American literary and cultural historians since at least the mid 20th century, uh, when Jewish American literary historiography was still in its swaddling clothes. This too I recently tried to elaborate elsewhere. Today my aims are modest. I want to look at one specific instance of this early conceptualization of the intimate relationship between Jewishness and assimilation. <coughs> A graduation address delivered in 1966 by historian and educator Gerson Cohen at Hebrew Teachers College in Boston, an address that afterwards became something of a cult classic among Jewish historians in America. It was called The Blessing of Assimilation in Jewish History. Speaking before a class of young men and women who had chosen to dedicate their lives to Jewish education and to the preservation of Jewish culture in, in America, that is, to opposing assimilation, Cohen suggests that, in fact, Jewish cultural vitality is, always has been, and always should be a product of assimilation. Noting Bar Kapara's second century, a century dictum, oft repeated in various versions since then, that the Jews were redeemed from Egypt because they refused to change their names, their language, and their clothes, in other words, that their survival, and by implication, the survival of Jews throughout the ages, depended upon the refusal to assimilate Egyptian culture. Cohen argues that, for all its polemical force, however it tugs at Jewish heartstrings, the dictum is simply not true. Much of his address consists of an erudite romp through Jewish history, from Second Temple Palestine to Philo's Alexandria, Alexandria to the Babylon of the Geonim, to the golden age of Spain and beyond, to the rise of the Wissenschaft des Judentums and to Zionism, all for the purpose of showing 
how Jews freely and fruitfully borrowed from host cultures to meet the challenges of their day, how these acts of assimilation had in fact produced the great classic works of Jewish literature and philosophy. In Cohen's view, each individual Jewish community around the world and throughout the ages produces its own version of Jewish culture out of the materials available to it. Um, on one hand, from tradition, and on the other hand, out of those it assimilates from its host culture, including the host's language, all in response to the needs and demands of its time and place. Jewish literary and intellectual history is, in Cohen's address, a continuum of contiguities, a series of distinct and separate cultural creations that nevertheless, by virtue of a power Cohen never really identifies, form a coherent national narrative. The Jewish American case, he tells the fledgling educators, should be no different from the rest. His charge to the young teachers, go out and assimilate. Few would argue in principle with Cohen's formulation of Jewish cultural history nowadays. This great conference testifies to the fact that Jews indeed have changed their languages and have produced great bodies of Jewish literature. Even the highest ghetto walls we now know were considerably permeable. And no one truly believes that Moshe Rabbeinu wore a strimal. But the address suggests a theory of literary and cultural history and an understanding of the role of assimilation in that history that is far more complicated uh, than that contained in my brief summary. The very pro provocative nature of Cohen's title presumes an underlying discomfort in his immediate audience at the time, and I think by extension in the broader community of mid 20th century American Jews. <clears throat> After all, Cohen was preaching to the converted, not to the graduates of the Chaim Berlin Yeshiva or to the Society of Ethical Culture, but to teachers ready to bring Judaism into, modern, into, into the modern American world. Still, he knew, they harbored a lingering sense that Bar Kapara was right. He wanted to reassure them that their way was the right way, that resistance to assimilation was not only futile, but counterproductive, that the assimilation of American culture would make their Jewishness more resilient, that, boldly stated, assimilation is a blessing. But the address is not consistently or sappily reassuring. On the contrary, the blessing of assimilation in Jewish history is darkly haunted by an undefined, nebulous enemy, which, more than coincidentally, also happens to be called assimilation. Again and again, he asks his audience not to misconstrue, misconstrue his title. Make no mistake, he says, assimilation is and always has been a great threat and challenge to the Jewish group. Again and again, he implores the graduates to face up squarely to the challenge of assimilation. He soberly talks about assimilation as if it were an invading army, or better yet, as if it were a danger, dangerous ideology like communism. Remember, this is mid 20th century America, and the Cold War is still raging. Okay. He talks about the threat of assimilation, the pitfalls of assimilation, the inroads of assimilation. He talks about creeping assimilation, something that Jews need to be vigilant about resisting and repelling, lest they get overrun and vanquished. Indeed, while he pointedly never identifies America itself as the source of the threat, I'll come back to that later, Cohen suggests that in a free society, assimilation is as challenging, if not more challenging, than ever. So while he determinedly counts the blessings of assimilation as if they were the inevitable results of benign cultural borrowing, he cannot seem to escape preaching soberly about the dangers of assimilation, just as the acolytes of Bar Kapara might. Trying to define and occupy a middle ground between the fossilized ghetto Jews who outright reject change and the renegade, renegade apostates, those opportun this is a quote, those opportunists or despondent persons who have preferred to identify totally with the majority group and have slipped away from the Jewish community, striving to balance his rhetoric between thinly veiled despair and blind optimism, between, quote, the ominous dread of a Cassandra and the rosy eyes of a Pollyanna, Cohen's own profound ambivalence is palpable. Or better, since my aim is not to psychoanalyze, but to inch towards a theory of Jewish literary history, let me put it this way. The ambivalence couched in Cohen's rhetoric, the tension between what seemed to be 
two mutually exclusive views of assimilation is a necessary element of his theory of literary history and a deliberate element in his rhetorical strategy. Assimilation has always been a term fraught with ambiguity, and Cohen's ambivalence wallows and thrives in the ambiguity of assimilation. Two years earlier, sociologist Milton Gordon had published his groundbreaking Assimilation in American Life, in which he attempts to dispel the confusion in the term by distinguishing among seven stages of cultural accommodation to America, introducing, for instance, the term acculturation to signify a cultural or behavioral assimilation as distinct from, say, marital assim assimilation, intermarriage, or structural identificational assimilation, the disappearance of an ethnic group as a group. And indeed, Cohen knew the term acculturation, using it once or twice in his address, but always in conjunction with assimilation, never as distinct from it. He chooses rather to stay within the ambiguity of assimilation rather than to dispel it. At one point, he seems to suggest that the distinction between what he eventually calls healthy assimilation and unhealthy assimilation is simply quantitative. A certain amount of assimilation and acculturation, he says, is good for you, but too much is bad. At another point, he writes that, like the Torah itself, assimilation is a drug capable of paralyzing or energizing, depending on how we take it and how we react to it. Assimilation is a sam chayim, some of it. I was not knocked down by that, that uh, analogy. He, assimilation is just like the Torah. He cultivates the ambiguity of assimilation, determined to maintain the tensions between the dangers and blessings of assimilation in American culture, as if the emergence of a rich and vital Jewish American literature and culture were not simply a matter of training modern Americanized teachers, as if he needed the threat of assimilation to bring forth its blessing. For Cohen, Jewish literary history harbors within it both meanings of assimilation. Each great work of Jewish literature, each chapter of Jewish literary history is so construed, fraught with ambivalence, caught between the Jews' need to assimilate and their fear of assimilation. This vision, let me point out, is a profoundly and admittedly diaspora vision. We Jews have always been and will doubtless continue to be a minority group, he writes. This is 1966, he writes. So the threat of assimilation and its problems have always been with and will continue to be with uh, us until the vision of Isaiah becomes a reality. America becomes another in a long line of host cultures to in the Jews' long, rich continuum of contiguities, a long line of host cultures necessary by definition for assimilation, and hence for the Jews' continual cultural flourishing. Now, my point is neither to endorse nor criticize this vision, but to introduce an irony. To justify and authorize his diaspora theory of Jewish literary history, Cohen turns to a Zionist thinker, to Asher Ginsberg, to a Chada'am. This is Cohen. In seeking to distinguish this revitalizing type of assimilation and imitation from the kind which aims at obliterating Jewish identity, Achad Ha'am characterized the cultural products born of assimilation as the imitation motiv motivated by the desire to compete rather than to be absorbed. Chikui shel hitcharut rather than of hitbolelut. That's his term. He doesn't exactly get it right. In competitive imitation, Achad Am detected, this is, I'm continuing um, Cohen's paragraph. In competitive assimilation, Achad Am detected the signs of health and vigor rather than that of attrition and decadence. There can be little doubt that Achad Am's reading of the past was highly perspicacious. Who will deny that much of Jewish philosophy and belles lettres were virtually conscious efforts at imitation of and competition with the cultures among which Jewish writers and thinkers lived, who indeed. Cohen finds in Achad Ha'am an historical precedent for his assimilation-based theory of Jewish literary history. Yet, to come to the conclusion he desires, the cultivation of Jewish American culture, Cohen must signif significantly misread Achad Ha'am, who comes to a strikingly different conclusion. Now, 
going into a haram a little bit. The text Cohen refers to here is, of course, Achad Am's well-known essay, Chikui V'hit Bolalut, Imitation and Assimilation, which he published in, 18, in 1894. If Cohen's strategy is deliberately to blur distinctions, Achad Am's strategy is to multiply distinctions, not distinctions in kinds of assimilation, but in kinds of imitation. He begins with the common depreciatory sense of imitation, to be like others, in Hebrew, lihidamot el achirim an inauthentic, albeit ingrained human tendency, a violation of a person's own inner life, an action, thought, or feeling that does not emerge from the depths of his interior world, a self-evident evil. He appreciates the fact that this view has a certain moral force, um, but he dismisses it as unreflective. As an alternative, he introduces a more dispassionate sense of the term, drawing upon the thought of Gabriel Tard, uh, the then well-known French sociologist and philosopher whose influential volume, Les Lois d'Imitation, was published in 1890, The Laws of Imitation, to suggest that imitation is the basic and essential building block of society. And while he does see in Tard a certain amount of exaggeration and one-sidedness, he nevertheless insists that his fundamental point is correct that even a cursory view of history confirms Tard's contention that imitation is the necessary foundation of society. To explain this idea of imitation, he offers a speculative anthropology, common enough in philosophical discourse from the Enlightenment onwards, that is, uh, a narrative that imagines the progress of society from the state of nature, um, in this case in three stages. And along, along the way, he introduces two types of imitation, that will concern him for the rest of the essay. First, people gather around a strong and charismatic leader for reasons of sustenance and protection. They subordinate themselves to him and imitate him, and hence primitive society is born. This imitation is self-effacing, chikui shel hitpatlut, a necessary and beneficial kind of imitation at this stage of history. Second, as time goes on and society develops, subordination and self-effacing imitation continues but in an altered form. As practices are passed down from generation to generation, the subordination is not to a charismatic individual, but to ancestors, to tradition, to custom. Ironically, ancestor worship frees the individual from that other kind of self-effacing self subordination uh, to some contemporary strongman, so that in a third stage, although imitation still continues, it is no longer self-effacing, but competitive. That is, an individual sees another individual worth imitating, but the goal is not to be like somebody in a slavish way, but out of jealousy and self-love, to be equal to or better than the other individual. This is chikui shel hitcharut. Note that for a chad ha'am, competitive imitation presumes some sort of self-effacing imitation to tradition, whatever. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, what is true of individuals, Acharam continues, is also true for societies. Uh, this is a section uh, of his essay that is of most interest to Cohen. When societies come into contact, imitation is as inevitable as it is for primitive individuals. Here, too, there are two possibilities. When the two societies are equal in strength and or culture, then imitation will be competitive. When they are unequal, then the imitation is self-effacing. It's at this point only after having established all the imitative building blocks of society that Achad Am introduces the term hitbolulut, the word we translate as assimilation. And he uses it very strictly as the disappearance of cultural distinctiveness. While competitive imitation leads to cultural revival, self-effacing imitation leads to hitbolulut. And it is this particular distinction to which Cohen turns to authorize his ambivalent diaspora theory of Jewish literary creativity a creativity, assimilate or be assimilated. But it is precisely at this point in his argument that Achadam himself turns away from the problem of assimilation altogether. He suggests that Jews will always have enough self-respect not to accept Gentile, uh, Gentile culture whole hog, as it were. Even reformed Jews, the anti-nationalist arch enemies of the Zionists, tend to imitate German culture competitively and maintain their ethnic distinctiveness. But here's the point that Cohen overlooks. Achad Am does not see competitive imitation as the end all of Jewish survival. In fact, 
He sees it potentially as even more dangerous than self-effacing imitation, more threatening and more disastrous than Hitbolulut. Given the Gola, given the fact that Jewish communities exist all over the world, he argues that competitive imitation, chikui shel hitcharut, could lead toward the establishment of countless different Judaisms, developing concurrently but separately, and hence lead to hitpardut, toward the fragmentation and dissolution of the Jewish nation. Significantly, Achadam implies that Jewish survival requires a kind of self-effacing imitation requires a, self, a kind of self-effacing imitation, a subordination of the various Jewish selfhoods to a dominant spiritual center, and he calls for the establishment of such a spiritual center in uh, Palestine. Okay, just one, uh, one page more. Again, let me be clear. My intention is not to offer a Zionist critique of Cohen's theory, uh, or for that matter, to suggest the diaspora critique of Ahad Am. I'm trying simply to understand how Cohen conceptualizes the role of assimilation in Jewish American literary history. The fact that Cohen turns to Achad Am for validation, yet resists his conclusion that he confuses Achad Am's distinctions in support of his own ambiguities, adds another layer of ambivalence to Cohen's address. Who will deny that much of Jewish philosophy and belles lettres were virtually conscious efforts at imitation of and competition with the cultures among which Jewish writers and thinkers lived? That's Cohen. At this point of validation, the point that competitive imitation leads to cultural creativity, the point from which Achadam turns to face Zion, at this point, Cohen backs away from the argument in deference to American difference and insists on altering Achadam's terminology. This is Cohen, and this I'm going to end. However, even if this reading of earlier forms of healthy assimilation is correct, he says, in, in the present context of freedom and equality, and above all, in the context of increasing tolerance that <coughs> Jews of the Western world enjoy, the motivation for competition has lost much of its drive. Indeed, in a world in which well-intentioned people are bent on reducing tensions and differences, cultural competition has an almost sinister ring. This is Cohen. I would therefore speak of the healthy appropriation of new forms and ideas for the sake of growth and enrichment. Now, me. Competitive imitation without the competition. Cultural difference without the difference. The threat of assimilation without the threat. Cohen embraces Achad Am only to let him slip away under the pressure of American openness. If the motivation for competition has lost much of its drive, what is left to spur the healthy appropriation of new ideas and forms? Cohen doesn't say. How is the promise um, of reduced differences different from the threat of assimilation? Cohen doesn't say. Yet, as difference diminishes, he seems to persist in the belief that it remains. If not as material fact, then as inchoate assumption and as moral imperative. No wonder Cohen is, is so insistent, yet so vague, about the dangers of assimilation. No wonder he maintains that both the threat to the Jewish community and the promise of Jewish continuity must have the same name. As competitive imitation fades into the healthy appropriation of new forms and ideas for the sake of growth and enrichment, an embryonic theory of Jewish American literary history begins to emerge, still unformed, undifferentiated, cautious, yet confident of the blessings of assimilation yet to come. Thank you.